and another hello to you. In part 2D of our discussion on destruction, we'll investigate the possible conditions before and during the flood, as explained on pages 83 to 91 in the book. While learning more about the flood, keep in mind, none of us were there, which is why we can only draw conclusions regarding the circumstances before the flood by looking at fossils and landscapes and comparing that to what has been revealed in the Bible. The flood occurred about 2,500 years before Christ. So that is about 4,500 years ago. And the Bible is filled with details about the flood. In fact, the flood represents the most detailed account of any single event in the Bible. And in addition, there is very clear evidence in nature that testifies to the consequences of the flood. It appears that the climate before the flood was nice and warm, all the way from the North Pole to the South Pole. This is mainly because deserts, glaciers, ice caps and higher sea levels probably did not exist before the flood. This means that more ground surface was available for the growth of a much larger amount of plants than today. The higher number of plants on Earth before the flood would have caused higher levels of carbon dioxide, we abbreviate that as CO2, to be produced. Why? Well, do you remember learning on day three of creation week how plants breathe out oxygen and they breathe in carbon dioxide, while living organisms such as humans and animals breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide? So plants take carbon dioxide out of the air by a process that we call photosynthesis to make solid tissue such as leaves, wood, bark, roots, fruits, seed. You'll still learn all about that in school. Then after dying, the plants return carbon dioxide back to the air by decaying and specifically through the respiration of microorganisms in the process of decay. And because there were so many more plants on Earth before the flood, a lot more carbon dioxide would have been produced in the atmosphere after they died because of their decay. And it would also have resulted in warmer temperatures because the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide prevents warm air from leaving the Earth. We are often told that carbon dioxide is bad somehow. But the truth is that higher carbon dioxide levels actually improve plant growth and productivity. Other emissions such as sulfur dioxide and soot are undesirable and should be reduced. But carbon dioxide is a God-designed, colorless, odorless gas and a crucial part in the cycle of life. Further evidence of the warmer climate before the flood is the discovery of various plant fossils all around the world, even under Antarctica's ice caps, where coal seams have been discovered. Coal is actually plant material that is fossilized, and these coal seams contain plants which don't occur in the polar regions today, but only in warmer parts. In other words, these plant fossils indicate that The earth was nice and warm before the flood, even in what we know to be the polar regions today. Now the fossils provide us with a photo of the kind of plant and animal life that existed on earth the day that Noah went into the ark. It reveals a pre-flood world that was very green and moist and absolutely teeming with plants and animals. Very likely only broad rivers and shallow seas existed. Before the flood, most of the water was probably located deep in the earth's mantle, where there's still a lot of water present today. Dinosaurs were alive and initially all of them ate plants. Animals that eat plants are known as herbivores. After sin came into the world, some animals became carnivores and carnivores eat the flesh of other animals. The flesh-eating dinosaurs probably spent most of their time attacking and eating the large plant-eating dinosaurs. Be that as it may, mankind's sin affected the whole of creation 
very negatively. Before the fall, all the animals ate plants, not each other. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Some people believe that the flood was just a local event. In other words, they think that the water did not cover the entire earth, but only a smaller local area where Noah once lived. If this was true, why did God not simply tell Noah to move away somewhere, maybe to a high mountain? Why did he have to take birds or flying animals on board? They could have simply flown away if it was just a local flood. But more importantly, Although God almost completely destroyed all life on earth, he promised that there would never again be another worldwide flood. And as a sign of his promise, he gave us the rainbow. Through the years, many local floods have occurred in various places on earth. But there has never ever been another worldwide one, such as in the days of Noah. Consider this. If Noah's flood was only a local flood, it would mean that God has broken his promise over and over and over again. Because there has been countless local floods on earth since Noah's time. God never breaks his promises. In the same way that the fossils remind us how God almost completely destroyed the earth with a worldwide flood, the rainbow serves as a beautiful reminder of his promise to us that he will never destroy the earth in this manner again. We know that a great destruction is coming, but it will be by fire, not by a flood. You can read all about that in 2 Peter 3, verse 10 to 12. The Bible clearly tells us that it was a worldwide flood, but in addition, there are at least 500 non-biblical legends worldwide the Taliba flood, and the details are remarkably similar to that which has been revealed in the Bible. From the third day of creation until just before the flood, the earth looked completely different from what it looks like today, probably with one supercontinent, not necessarily in the shape of what is called Pangaea, but probably much, much bigger. We read about this in Genesis 1 verse 9 to 10. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. We'll learn more about this shortly. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Genesis 7:11 contains a lot of information. God's word describes how he caused the dry land to come forth out of the water on the third day of creation week. A certain amount of the water that initially covered the earth was probably trapped in and under the land in the process. In fact, geologists have calculated that the rocks in earth's mantle still contain enough water in their mineral structure to fill up the oceans ten times over. This image shows you where the mantle is located. So if the ocean was a giant bathtub and you pulled out the plug so that all the water in the ocean drained out. You would be able to fill up the ocean basins ten times over with the water still present in the mantle. The breaking up of the fountains, according to Genesis 7.11, implies a release of hot magma mixed with steam that pierced the earth's crust so that, so that giant rifts ran thousands of miles across the planet 
tearing open the Earth's surface, for example, where we find the mid-oceanic ridge. These ridges that are shown by the red color in the image were discovered in the 1950s and they follow a huge circular route across the Earth to form the Earth's longest mountain range of 74,030 kilometers in length. Scalding hot magma vaporized massive amounts of steam or water into superheated steam that jetted into the atmosphere and then falling back to the earth for 40 days as intense global rain, along with torrential rain from heaven, as described in Genesis 7:11. The hot magma that pushed up out of the rifts formed a new hot ocean floor, so hot that it began to well up, pushing up the ocean water so that the sea level rose dramatically and overflowed the land. In your school textbooks, you will learn about Pangaea, a hypothetical supercontinent that included all current land masses believed to have been in existence before the continents broke apart millions of years ago. But as mentioned, although we have some idea, no one really knows exactly how the continents fit together in the past, nor do we, do we know how big that supercontinent really was. And did the continents really take millions of years to move apart? The Earth's surface consists of a mosaic of rigid plates, each moving as the other one moves. This movement or drifting of the continents is called continental drift. One of the theories on continental drift, called catastrophic plate tectonics by Dr. John Bohm Gardner, explains how the speed with which the continents moved apart could have been up to 150 feet per second. Now that's quite fast, more like a continental sprint than continental drift. And this probably happened when certain plates slid beneath other plates. We call that subduction. So the breaking up of the fountains of the deep caused the supercontinent to be broken up with the plates moving away from each other, sliding under one another and sometimes ramming into each other to form today's mountain ranges. In this way, the continents moved into their current positions within just a few months. The fact that the fountains are mentioned first is probably an indication that the most important source of water came from the earth as well as from the oceans. These fountains did not stop squirting water until a full 150 days or five months of the flood had run its course. Now there was also another type of fountain that broke apart at this time and that was the reservoir of the underground molten rock or magma. Today there are many volcanic rocks found scattered in between the sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks were laid down during the flood. It is therefore very likely that this breaking up of the fountains included a series of volcanic eruptions, especially where that hot new ocean floor began to dive under the continents that we call subduction zones. Large amounts of water were released from beneath the surface in the process and violent earthquakes and tsunamis occurred. Did you know that up to 70% of what is released from a volcano is actually water in the form of steam. And the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. It continued to rain non-stop for 40 days and 40 nights. Some people believe that there used to be a thick water vapor canopy around the earth and that all the water for the flood came from there. But a lot of research was done on this, and if such a canopy existed before the flood, it could never have been thicker than about two meters, because if it was any thicker, this would have caused the temperature on Earth to be far too hot due to the greenhouse effect. A two meter thick water vapor canopy would not have made a significant contribution to the 40 days and nights of rainfall anyway. According to the catastrophic plate tectonics model, volcanic activity 
would have caused large amounts of superheated steam to be released from the earth, which would have caused intense global rainfall. So the water for the flood definitely did not come from the sky alone. Most of the water li most likely came from within the earth and the sea. Let's now have a look at fossils and how they are formed. A fossil is the remains of a once living ancient organism, about 4,500 years old, that is embedded and preserved in rock. It includes plants, animals and their parts like shells and teeth and bones or complete skeletons as well as the tracks that they left behind. Now some fossils no longer contain the organism's original material but consist of minerals that penetrated the organism to take on its form. These minerals eventually harden to stone. We call that petrification. And so the minerals are in the exact shape of the organism or a part of it, but the organism itself is missing in action. The organism is now called a fossil. Researchers have found that chicken bones and wood can be replaced with minerals in just five to 10 years while a large dinosaur bone might take hundreds of years to completely mineralize. It all depends on the burial conditions over the years. Many dinosaur remains have still not completely turned to stone. In fact, more than half of the fossil is usually still original bone, not stone. Some fossil fish still had a fishy smell when they were first discovered. Large amounts of wood from trees that were growing at the same time when dinosaurs roamed the earth have been preserved but have not yet been fossilized. Now when mentioning the word fossil, most people think of a slow gradual process over millions of years during which rock layers or volcanic ash slowly covered the organism. If this were true, it must have been an absolutely miraculous event because how could this have happened slowly without the organism decaying or being scavenged? For example, when a fish dies today, why doesn't it change into a fossil? Instead it bloats, floats for a while and rots. Eventually it sinks below the water surface where scavengers ravage it and you just see scales floating in all directions. Basically nothing's left of it. Let's use an example of a larger animal. Bisons were hunted almost to extinction a mere hundred years ago. Where are all their fossils? What happened to all the carcasses that were spread over the American plains in uncountable millions just two generations ago? It barely left a trace. Scavengers ate the meat and even the skeletons eventually disappeared. So clearly the size has nothing to do with the fact that they didn't fossilize. There is an excess of fossilized plants in the sedimentary layers or strata. Yet, when a plant dies today, even a giant redwood or a baobab tree, it simply turns back to dust over time. Why doesn't it fossilize? The answer is simple. It takes very special conditions for fossilization to take place. Even though we have literally discovered billions of fossils in the sedimentary strata, fossils have never, ever formed at this magnitude in recent times. So what are the conditions required for a fossil to form? A sudden death, a sudden burial, and very high pressure to lock out the oxygen because if oxygen had been present, the organism would have rotted before it could have turned to stone. The higher the pressure, the faster the sediments encapsulating the organism would have hardened. Now those sediments that I keep mentioning are actually mud consisting of soil, sand, pebbles, and clay particles that were deposited in various different layers or strata, similar to pancakes, to form the sedimentary strata. And you can see it nicely on this photo taken in the Golden Gate National Park in South Africa. Now, if you poured some soil, sand, and gravel into a container with water, stirred it a bit, and let it settle, you will notice how the heaviest parts, such as the pebbles, sink to the bottom almost immediately, followed by another layer on top of the pebbles. And this would be followed by another layer of sand 
and eventually a fine layer of clay would be deposited on top. The layer with the lowest density will normally be deposited on top. So the less dense layers will usually occur on top and the more dense layers at the bottom. And in principle, that is exactly what happened during the flood, only on a much, much bigger scale. Worldwide, the catastrophic rifting caused massive mud-filled tsunamis to speed across the deep and then shallow ocean floors in cycles, killing everything in its path. Soil and plants were ripped up and enormous amounts of sediment or, or mud were deposited in layers, burying billions upon billions of plants and animals in what we call today the fossil record that have since turned to stone. In fact, fossils, in other words, the remains of plants and animals or parts of them, are only found within the sedimentary strata because they were buried there during the flood. These fossil-bearing sedimentary rock layers cover almost three-quarters, 75% of the Earth's surface. Now you know why. It's all because of the flood. The fossil record isn't about time periods, but rather it is about the location in which organisms occurred and the order in which they were buried by the rising sediment-laden waters of the flood. Interestingly, there is a certain order in the fossil record. Simplified, it looks like this. At the bottom, we find mostly single-celled microorganisms. Since the flood began in the sea, when the fountains of the deep burst forth, we would expect enormous amounts of muddy sediments and marine invertebrates to be ripped up by the turbulent waters. As the flood waters flooded the continents, Huge numbers of these shallow marine invertebrates such as sea sponges and snails, inkfish and crabs and other marine creatures were buried on the continents in rapid succession. This is followed by amphibians such as frogs and lizards. Next up is the dinosaurs which are land-living reptiles followed by the large land-living mammals and birds. Most of the coal that we still mine today were also formed during the flood. The fossil record clearly shows how, once upon a time, a huge catastrophe occurred where billions upon billions of plants and animals were rapidly covered and buried in the sedimentary strata where they later turned to fossils. But how rapidly did this really happen? Did it take months, weeks, days, minutes, seconds? A clear fossil of an extinct marine reptile called the ichthyosaur was discovered. This is a fossil of a mother who has almost finished giving birth to her live little bambino. Only the mouth of the baby is still in the mother's birth canal. This illustration shows it in more detail. It is clear that both were overwhelmed and buried very rapidly, probably during the flood. It must have happened rapidly, otherwise both would have either rotted or would have been eaten by scavengers. The other option, if evolution were true, is that the mother lay on the ocean floor for thousands of years, giving birth to her little baby while the sediment slowly covered them over thousands of years and they somehow fossilized without decaying or being scavenged. What makes more sense to you, slow or fast? There's even been a discovery of a fossil fish swallowing another fish. With its mouth full of food, the fish and its meal were squished as flat as a pancake. Only the tail of the fish being eaten was still sticking out for decoration or just maybe so that we could clearly see this evidence for what it really is. Clearly it must have been a very sudden and rapid event. If we are able to see a fossil of one fish swallowing another fish before they were both buried under muddy layers. Other interesting discoveries include fossilized jellyfish. Can you believe that? Even fossilized giant oysters have been discovered, about 500 of them at an altitude of 4,000 meters above sea level in Peru. But how could oysters have lived up there? When an oyster dies, its shell opens up. However, if the oyster is buried alive 
under very high pressure or dies very suddenly, the shell remains closed. The shells of these multitude of fossilized oysters were all closed, which means they must have been alive when they were suddenly buried under a colossal mass of sediments and then these areas were pushed up towards the end of the flood to form the mountains such as the Andes that we can see today. Psalm 104 clearly describes how the mountains lifted and the valley sank down and also how the water ran off the continents into the new ocean basins. The entire process certainly did not take millions of years but in fact happened really, really fast. We'll learn more about this in the next episode. Thank you.